This is BBC One in the East Midlands. Now the news at 10 o'clock with Peter Sissons and Lisa Dransfield. Tony Blair promises to produce the evidence that justifies war with Iraq. He backs America to the hilt but says no decisions have been taken. Iraq makes overtures to the UN. America says that's a ploy. Firefighters are warned if you get 40%, everyone's mortgage goes up. And an operation for Keen, will it remove the sting of an FA ban? Here in the East Midlands, an elusive estate agent turns up, but with his company owing half a million pounds, homeowners may still be out of pocket. And at a standstill, why security checks mean taxi drivers can't operate. Good evening. There was no going back today for Tony Blair on Iraq. He promised to produce the evidence soon that Saddam Hussein, appalling, brutal, dictatorial and vicious, was still developing chemical, biological and nuclear weapons. And he said if that didn't change, Saddam Hussein had to go. Unlike the United States, Mr Blair did leave the door open for the United Nations, but only if it could deal with Iraq and not avoid the issue. From Mr. Blair's news conference in his northeast constituency, our political editor, Andrew Marr. In normal times, this is the heart of Blair country, his own constituency of Sedgefield. But when it comes to the prospect of war against Iraq, there is no secure Blair country. And after a month away, the Prime Minister knows it. Over the summer, public scepticism about an attack on Saddam Hussein has been fueled by a lack of hard facts about the real threat Iraq poses. We have heard again and again that there is a dossier of evidence about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. Why haven't we got it up to now and when are we going to see it? Whatever timelines we've been working on um, as, as leaders, if you like, it's clear that the debate has moved on. Now, originally, I had the intention um, that we wouldn't get round to publishing the dossier until we'd actually taken the, the key decisions. I think probably it's a better idea to bring that forward. That'll happen within the next few weeks, a significant change of tack. But meanwhile, what evidence against Iraq could Tony Blair give us now? Well, one piece of evidence is that they're in breach of 23 of the demands that the UN has made in respect of their weapons chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. Second piece of evidence is that we know that vast amounts of chemical and biological weapon stocks are unaccounted for. Third piece of evidence is that every time they haven't been contained, they've gone out and attacked people. The fourth piece of evidence is that they're the only regime I know of anywhere in the world that's actually used these weapons in order to kill thousands of innocent people. Full United Nations weapons inspection remain his first priority, but at times Mr Blair sounded today as if he couldn't imagine this ending without Saddam Hussein himself being toppled. Either the regime starts to function in an entirely different way, and there hasn't been much sign of that, or the regime has to change. Now that's the choice, very simply. Is it? There's a hard core of doubters who won't be won round. Mr Blair today openly appealed to other sceptics like Labour's Donald Anderson. This is no more today than a promise of giving evidence. The evidence has not yet been given and a promise obviously to look at the weapons inspection. The Tories tonight offered personal support for Tony Blair but are eagerly feeling for a major Labour split. What I do think is that uh, he now has to show that not only does he have a very clear realisation of the threat and the need to deal with it, but that his cabinet does as well. We've heard many rumours recently that his cabinet is at sixes and sevens with him. I think he's now got to show his quality of leadership within his own cabinet to, to show that they are prepared to follow him in what he said today. Tony Blair's just walked into his local boozer behind me to carry on what's going to be a months-long campaign of persuasion. Even here in Sedgefield, there's a lot of convincing to do. But one thing was absolutely clear from his press conference here. If it comes to a choice between endless negotiation and conflict, what they used to call jaw-jaw or war-war, then you better believe it. It's going to be the second. Andrew Marr, BBC News in Sedgefield. In the United States, the Bush administration said it also may offer more evidence of the threat posed by Iraq. Echoing Tony Blair, the Defence Secretary Donald Rumsfeld said information could be released during congressional hearings on Iraq later this month. 
Snipers on the roof. It's the White House in jittery times. Relief behind these walls that Tony Blair has come out in support of an isolated George Bush. And exasperation here too from one prominent hawk that the rest of the world seems to be making too little of Saddam Hussein and too much of divisions in the administration. Aha! There's a disagreement there. He said this, she said that. What about this? What about that? That's baloney. These people meet together all the time. They know what each other thinks. Do they sometimes say things one way and someone else might have said it some other different way? Sure they do. But what's important is what the president says, and what's important is what the president decides. All harmony in this cabinet, of course. These are the latest pictures of Saddam Hussein and his ministers in green. Until plausible evidence is presented against him and his weapons of mass destruction, public opinion everywhere will continue to flounder. No wonder, then, that the Iraqis are doing their best to woo the world. In Johannesburg, Saddam Hussein's chief lieutenant met the UN Secretary General, who's keen to send his weapons inspectors back to Iraq. Well, no, con no conditions. A few minutes later, he popped up on Good Morning America. We are ready to work with the United States, with the Security Council, to reach the truth. But if it is a pretext, a, a hoax pretext to attack Iraq, what can we do? But on the streets of the capital, even those who think in strategic terms aren't sure about the next move. I don't think the United States should go over there at all. I don't understand why they bother them people. We got more problems over here in the United States. There's nothing compelling to suggest that right now, immediately, we need to take care of, of war, launch a new war when we're already fighting a war in Afghanistan. There is relief here that Tony Blair is now firmly on side, but the real lobbying for international and domestic opinion begins in earnest tomorrow when President Bush meets congressional leaders on Capitol Hill. He's going to sound out their opinions, he may seek their support, but what makes it all more confusing and complicated is that he himself does not appear to have made up his mind yet over Iraq. Matt Fry, BBC News, Washington. Well, I'm joined now from Sedgefield by our political editor Andrew Marr and from the World Summit in Johannesburg by our World Affairs editor John Simpson. John, on this issue, does the US have any friends in the world besides the UK? Well, you wouldn't think so, Peter, if you go the rounds of the diplomats and the politicians here. Um, you'd think that they're all solidly against it. But you get the feeling, actually, that that's partly because they know the folks back home want them to be against it, want them to be talking again about it. Uh, there's a lot of worries about what might happen to the Western Alliance, for instance, uh, if the bombing starts. But uh, the Americans certainly believe that once the things start to get into place, then quite a lot of the governments that seem to be opposed to it at the moment will be in favor. What you hear sometimes wistful British uh, diplomats and uh, more importantly politicians saying is that it's so extraordinary that probably the world's worst dictator with the world's worst record should be one of the most popular people here. If Saddam Hussein had turned up here today, he'd have got a roaring reception. And uh, that is a slight problem for the Americans and the way they've been handling the whole thing. As a Baghdad veteran, John, how do you read Iraq's uh, various statements about UN inspectors? Do they ever intend that they should return? What they want to do is to give very clearly the impression that they are being reasonable and sensible and they're perfectly happy to have anybody in there and they'll do anything and open any door uh, in order to show that they're innocent. Because they know that works, that really does schmooze people here. And uh, Tariq Aziz, for instance, has been schmoozing people ever since he's arrived and doing it very uh, satisfactorily from his point of view. Of course, what happens when the inspectors get there is something altogether different, but they want to give the impression of being easy and, uh, and uh, opening all the doors because they know that that does get them popular support abroad. John Simpson, thank you. Andrew Marr in Sedgefield. There are very few ifs and buts now about Tony Blair's position on Iraq, but he has left himself this small UN get-out clause. Will he push Washington for one more UN try? Yes, I think that's one of the messages here today. Um, he has a real problem as the person who always claims that he can bridge the Atlantic on these matters. 
everybody in Europe, um, everybody around the world is insisting the United Nations must matter, whereas the Americans just simply see this as another way of putting it off, another form of delay and faffing around giving Saddam Hussein more time. And Tony Blair's answer to that appears to be the United Nations will matter, does matter, so long as it is part of the solution, so long as they're going to try and enforce international law and their own resolutions quickly and clearly, and this is not just another excuse for delay. So that will be the message to the United Nations. I think one last throw. If America is determined to go to war, but the TUC, the Labour Party conference, half his MPs and the opinion polls stack up against him, what will he do? Well, it's a kind of awesome list when you uh, put it out like that. Um, my instinct is that he will do um, what he thinks is right in this circumstance, which is, surprise, surprise, uh, to stand alongside the Americans. We were all sitting there today looking for any sign of a flinch or a hesitational, hey, you know, it's a little bit more than I expected and I'm going to give it a bit more time. There was none of that. He could not have been more uh, unequivocal, more absolutely clear that Saddam's regime has got to go and that it's got to happen quite quickly. Something pretty substantial and serious is going to happen this winter. Andrew Mark, John Simpson, thank you. There have been big falls on stock markets across the world as worries about the American economy return to haunt investors. In London, the FTSE index of leading shares fell 3.5%, down 152 to 40.28. But New York was hit harder. The Dow Jones fell more than 4% to close at 8,308. As firefighters threaten to strike unless they get a 40% pay rise, the Prime Minister has warned that an increase on that scale would do terrible damage to the rest of the economy. The Firefighters Union has rejected suggestions for an independent pay review and says it's sticking to its demands. Firefighters in West London a short while ago dealing with a chemical spill. Today they've also put out fires and saved lives. They've been offered 4%, they want 10 times that amount. These on the Green Watch in Hammersmith are furious at the government's refusal to pay more. It seems that the government at the moment have enough money to be planning to invade Iraq, but don't have enough money to actually pay a service that actually do, do the things that they need. With firefighters and their local authority employers in stalemate, the minister responsible for the fire service suggested an independent review into pay and modernisation. I don't underestimate the challenges ahead, nor do I underestimate the damage that would be caused to the community and to the service itself by an unnecessary and destructive industrial conflict. But firefighters who yesterday protested in London said the minister shouldn't interfere. They were further incensed when today he called for a first-class service. The union says they already give that and should be paid accordingly. Since he doesn't believe professional firefighters are worth £30,000, is to tell firefighters of this nation what he does think they're worth, particularly those that were at the Potter's Bar incident or the King's Cross fire, or indeed any other major tragedies that happened around this country. Today's developments bring the prospect of a strike closer. But Tony Blair fears if firefighters got 40%, other public sector workers might want the same. This could bring higher inflation and a rise in interest and thus mortgage rates. It's business as usual for the firefighters. This evening, the Deputy Prime Minister, John Prescott, has been in phone contact with both sides trying to avert strike action. But there's little sign of compromise. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News, West London. The funerals of the murdered schoolgirls Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman have taken place in private. They were held separately after a service of remembrance for the two, t t for the two ten year olds last Friday. A cremation service for Jessica was held yesterday. Her best friend Holly was buried today. Security checks on new school staff in some parts of the country could take until Christmas. It had been hoped the vetting process by the Criminal Records Bureau would be completed in the next few weeks, but some councils say that won't be possible because hundreds of checks are still outstanding. The government of Gibraltar has set the 7th of November as the date for its referendum on whether Britain should share its sovereignty with Spain. Gibraltar's government will campaign, of course, for a no vote. Britain says the result won't affect talks with Spain on the territory's future. 
there should be stricter controls on the development of genetically modified and cloned animals, according to the government's own advisers. They're particularly concerned about the development of cloned pets and the releasing of GM fish into the wild. These pigs have been genetically engineered, so their organs can one day be transplanted into humans. They're among the latest in a growing number of creatures created by corporations to cure human diseases. Genetically modifying an animal is a highly skilled but essentially straightforward process. Elizabeth here is injecting DNA directly into that mouse embryo. Once the DNA is inserted, the embryo is implanted into a womb, and once the creature's born, bingo, you've created a new life form. But this is what happens when things go wrong. This pig was genetically modified to grow faster. It found it impossible to support its own weight. And these GM salmon are five times bigger than normal ones of the same age. Once released into the sea, they could breed and create dangerous mutant offspring. And with the cloning of this cat earlier this year, it's now possible to have several copies of a favourite pet. To stop this sort of thing becoming the norm, the government's biotechnology commission has recommended that there should be regular monitoring of new types of farm animals there should be regular health checks for GM and cloned animals and there should be no cloned pets. We want a complete review of all the ancient legislation that deals with animal welfare because it doesn't properly deal, we think, with the potential of this technology to produce quite objectionable uses and transformations of animals. Once again, as scientific advances have raised difficult moral questions, there are now calls for new laws to ensure that this new generation of custom-built animals benefit people without causing undue suffering. Alab Ghosh, BBC News. Human rights organisations have condemned Israel's decision to deport the brother and sister of a suspected Palestinian militant. In a controversial ruling, Israel's Supreme Court said the pair, who are accused of helping to organise a suicide bombing, could be expelled from their homes near the West Bank city of Nablus and sent to the fenced-off Gaza Strip. Eight months after the euro entered the tills of 12 countries, many of its users are complaining that they're out of pocket. Greek shoppers boycotted the shops today, saying traders had taken advantage of the changeover to round up prices. The French and Germans also claim their new currency has led to unprecedented price increases. Consumers of the world unite, boycott the shops for overcharging. The campaign in Athens was well organized. Greeks say the euro has led to price hikes and they just aren't going to take it anymore. Prices are now two or three times higher than usual, this man says. Something has got to be done. Money is slipping through our fingers. And the consumer boycott was reported to have kept the shops comparatively empty. And yet, inflation in Greece is only 3.6%. Yet the Greeks are not alone in complaining, despite relatively low inflation. In Germany, people have called the euro the toy euro, a play on the German word for expensive. Yet German inflation is just 1%, worryingly low. In France, consumers complain too, even though prices are up a mere 1.6% over last year. Across the eurozone, general inflation is running at about 2%, nothing to write home about. And the official estimate of how much the euro changeover added to prices is about 0.2%, minuscule amount. So the issue may not be so much how much prices have gone up, but how much the public feel prices have gone up. Over the years in the Eurozone, people's feelings about how high inflation is closely match how high inflation actually is. Perception and reality have moved together. Until the Euro. Now surveys show people feel inflation is higher, while the figures show it going down. No surprise that economists trust the figures, and the public notice, well, a few particular items that have gone up. Consumers may concentrate their attention on small items like the daily cup of coffee while uh, neglecting larger items they buy only once or twice a year, like uh, cars and uh, stereos, refrigerators, etc. What can't be denied, though, is that some prices have gone up significantly and some of them have gone up because of the euro. And whatever explanations people might have, the public don't like it. Evan Davis, BBC News.
There are new signs that the housing market is slowing down. The Halifax, Britain's biggest mortgage lender, says prices were almost static last month, up just 0.2%. It's unsettling news for those who fear a market slump, last seen in the early 90s. Rory Kettlin Jones has been looking at what can be learnt from home owners who were hit hardest the last time boom turned to bust. Jutland Road in Catford, not the most fashionable street in South London, but house prices have been galloping ahead here. The same was true in the late 80s when Natalie Ramroop bought her flat, but by 1992 the cost of her mortgage had soared, the house was worth less than she'd paid and she was facing eviction. A decade on and things have worked out for Natalie. She managed to hang on to her home and last weekend she sold it, doubling her money. Saturday morning I had viewers round and it sold straight away um, and it, it, it makes you feel good that you've, I've kept the property and I haven't lost out and I've actually gained now. Mortgage rates and repossessions are at very low levels, house prices are still rising, the whole market seems a very sunny place to be right now. But those who suffered last time boom turned to bust have a warning for anyone trying to buy property right now. Yeah. Hemel Hempstead in 1990 and the Martin family were facing up to losing their home after watching their mortgage payments quadruple. We've tried our best, we've put thousands of pounds into the property and it's just slipped away now. Eviction is the only answer. The Martins were evicted and have been renting from the council ever since. They've considered buying their council home but are cautious. You think is it going to happen again? This high rise of the prices going up now and maybe the slump will come again sometime in the future. Back in the late 80s, Stephen Bell was one of the few economists who saw a housing slump coming. He now thinks the market's heading for a similar but less painful fall. People are borrowing a lot, house prices are very high, particularly in London and the South East. People are speculating in the market. But there's one big difference. Interest rates are not, repeat, not going to 15% this time around. That means the wave of repossessions, which forced families like the Martins out of their homes, is unlikely to be repeated. But they're a reminder of how dangerous the property game can be. Rory Kathleen Jones, BBC News. Now football and an FA ban on Manchester United's captain Roy Keane could become meaningless because he's injured. The FA is due to decide this week on what action to take following controversial comments in Keane's autobiography. But today the player underwent hip surgery and will be out for six weeks. Just enough time to serve out a ban and recover from his injury. United fans arriving at Old Trafford this evening for the first of what's going to be a number of games without their captain. The main talking point was still Roy Keane sending off on Saturday after he'd elbowed the Sunderland player Jason McAteer. There was nine other sendings off at the weekend and there's only one made in, you know, sort of Sunday paper headlines. Even though I'm a staunch supporter of Roy Keane, I think what, what he did was completely wrong. The inspiration behind much of United's recent success will be out of action for at least the next six weeks. Today he underwent an operation for a hip injury. That conveniently takes him out of the limelight while his controversial book remains a focus of attention. Keane's autobiography was almost certainly going to lead to yet another enforced absence from the game anyway. Here at the Football Association, the contents of Roy Keane's book are still being scrutinised. It's likely that before the end of the week, Keane will be charged with bringing the game into disrepute. If found guilty, he could face a ban for that offence of around four matches. So Keane is facing disciplinary action, both for his comments in the book about Manchester City's Alfinger Haaland and his sending off on Saturday, which led to an automatic three-match ban from September the 14th. A four-match ban for the book could then begin on October the 7th. By November the 2nd, he'd be clear to play again. Good timing, as that could coincide with him getting back to full fitness from today's operation, ready for the Manchester derby on the 9th. But is he escaping justice? You know, if the FA want to use some imagination about this, they can use part of a suspension, maybe, while he's, while he's injured, part of it later condition upon good behaviour. They, they've got to use their imagination about how they deal with this. Well, perhaps it doesn't matter anyway. Tonight, United showed that they can still win without their captain. A Ruud van Nistelrooy penalty gave them victory over Middlesbrough. James Pearce, BBC News.
and it's 24 and a half minutes past 10. I'll be back later with an update on the day's headlines, but now we join our news teams across the United Kingdom. Hello there, good evening. The businessman behind failed estate agents, Aaron Scargill, today came face to face with his creditors. Vivinda Joel told creditors any money he owed would be repaid. But with his total debts estimated at around half a million pounds, not everyone was convinced. Pavinda Paul Johal arrived for today's creditors meeting saying nothing to the waiting media but knowing there were difficult questions waiting inside. What sort of um, money are you owed by um, Aaron Scargill? Uh, £2,400. Are you hoping of getting any money, do you think, from this meeting? I think it would be very, very unlikely. The receivers were called in at Aaron Scargill in July. The company office on this Lenton industrial estate was deserted as both landlords and home buyers were unable to trace owner Mr Johal and their cash. The meeting had lasted three hours. There'd been some heated exchanges, but what about the £400,000 owed by Aaron Scargill to its creditors? Uh, most of all answer. Outside, Mr Jahal insisted the company accounts were in order and that creditors would be repaid. Uh, every, most people who claim they've lost money will get, get money back. You can guarantee us that? Oh, I can't guarantee. Obviously, it's out of my hands. But the newly appointed liquidator isn't so confident. There may be a small dividend. Um, it depends upon what is discovered during the course of the liquidation. And an investigation into why Aaron Scargill collapsed is likely to take at least a year. Dave Harper, East Midlands Today, Nottingham. A section of one of our busiest roads has been reopened tonight after a multiple pile-up. Two people were seriously hurt and eight others suffered minor injuries following the accident on the A52 between Elton and Watton. The road was closed for a time with tailbacks up to seven miles long. Eight ambulances, two fire engines and the air ambulance were called to the scene, but none of the injuries were thought to be life-threatening. Next tonight, the chaos in our classrooms spreads to the cab ranks. Taxi firms in Leicester say they're losing money and having to take cars off the road because the Criminal Records Bureau hasn't finished security checks on their drivers. Andy Johnson reports. No, it's not a taxi rank, more like a car park. Swift Taxis has 21 cars out of a fleet of 150 off the road because security checks on potential drivers haven't come through. I've been in business now for 35 years and this is the worst I've ever known it, the amount of vehicles standing. We don't put vehicles on the, on the road to stand and park and not do any work. They've got to work, they've got to earn a living. That job for Neelash today, they've, they've put the time back. The calls keep coming in, but the drivers aren't there to handle the workload. If I can't cover the jobs, then, you know, these people aren't getting from A to B and we simply cannot cover the volume of work that we have at the moment because of these lack of drivers. But the company also blames the licensing authority at Leicester City Council for delaying getting the forms to the Criminal Records Bureau. Certainly we listen to the trade and uh, we looked at our own systems and we've now streamlined things. Uh, the licensing team processes their own forms, vets them and sends them off within one working day. The delay of eight to nine weeks is then solely down to the CRB, I'm afraid. There'll be no fares for these cabs for some time to come. If the situation continues, the company may have to take a drive to see its bank manager to ask for help. Andy Johnson, East Midlands Today, Leicester. A woman who saved her brother's life by giving him one of her kidneys is appealing for more people to be organ donors. Chris Lawton from Rutland was just weeks away from renal failure when his sister stepped in to help. The three-hour transplant operation has transformed his life. Six weeks ago, Chris Lawton was barely able to walk around the garden of his home in Essendine near Stamford. His kidneys were badly diseased. The options, the rest of his life on dialysis or a transplant. Time was running out, but he never thought of asking his family to help. I knew it was an option, but uh, never even contemplated bringing the subject up. Why not? <laughs> it was just a bit of a taboo subject, I suppose. It's just something that you can't bring up or ask. When his sister found out how seriously ill he was, she had no such reservations. But at 39 and the mother of three children, it wasn't an easy decision. I knew that um, eventually, I mean, he could die in a few years' time if the dialysis didn't work, um, his kidneys would collapse totally and uh, he could die. So I just thought, for love of my brother, I'll do it. 
Both Chris and Kathleen have made a swift recovery after the surgery at Leicester General Hospital. Now they want to encourage more people to become donors for relatives. Cathy Rochford, East Midlands Today, Rutland. A toddler who was killed yesterday in an accident at the Lincolnshire Garden Centre has been named. She was three-year-old Esther Harvey from Ruskington near Sleaford. Her family today issued a statement saying they were totally devastated by her death. She suffered serious head injuries when a building collapsed at a garden centre at Weston near Spalding. She died later in hospital. The nursery's owner today said he and all his staff wanted to pass on their heartfelt condolences to Esther's family. A full inquiry is now underway. Derby County's footballers aren't likely to be paid again until the club's financial future is secure. Salaries for August have been withheld by the bank, with the club are reported at £30 million in debt. The club's board is considering two rival takeover offers, and the Professional Footballers Association said it's been told there will be no wages until a bid, bid is accepted. Both the players and the PFA have expressed their concern at the situation. We can never be happy with any situation in which players have not received the wages. At least the players are fully aware of the situation, are fully aware that the club will be looking to pay them in the very, very near future. And we will be monitoring the situation. If we feel in the next couple of days that it doesn't happen, uh, then we're going to have to take it further. Time now for a quick look at the weather. Tonight, mainly dry. There's just a threat of a shower in the west. Some mist and fog will form as temperatures drop to 11 Celsius. And then tomorrow, it'll be murky at first, but soon sunny and warm with afternoon highs of 23 Celsius. That's it from us. Now back to Peter in London. And the main news tonight. Tony Blair has promised to produce evidence that will justify taking action against Saddam Hussein's regime. He's backed America to the hilt but right. said no decisions had been taken. Iraq has made overtures to the United Nations. America has dismissed them as a ploy. And the firefighters have been told that a 40% pay rise for them would be disastrous for the economy. Newsnight starting now over on BBC Two, but from the 10 o'clock news. Good night. Good evening to you. Good news for you. Summer's over. No, no, no. Seriously, that's only as far as we in the Med Office are concerned. But actually, we have a look, had a look at the summer statistics, and it was more or less average, actually, overall, as far as England and Wales is concerned, although it was the dullest since 1988, and of course, we all remember those flash floods. By contrast, down at the other end of the world, winter is just about over, and it's a very different story in Australia, where it's one of the worst droughts in history, and uh, certainly there since records began in 1900. There's a typhoon right at the top of your picture heading towards uh, generally the area of Taiwan and as you can see here across Australia it's still clear skies. Now it's a different story closer to home because we're about to have I think a taste of autumn if nothing else. We get rid of that little area of low pressure that will be giving us some shower.